so now coming to the hypertrophy hypertrophy is something it's very easy and uh, you if you look at any ecg textbook actually there will be so many criteria to assess the ecg but in the relevant clinical practice the, uh, the ecg diagnosis of hypertrophy has not much clinical implication so we always uh, look at the uh, echocardiogram to finalize because the sensitivity of ecg to determine the uh, the hypertrophy is not much you have only 20 to 30% uh, uh, sensitivity so you miss almost 70 to 80% of the uh, hypertrophic patients just by uh, interpreting the ecg alone so the but as an academic exercise you should know actually when you see large complexes how to say hypertrophy so the basic principle is actually i mean you can uh, look at the precordial leads and add the biggest r wave and the biggest s wave so if if the uh, biggest r wave plus s wave is more than 30 to 35 mm that means hypertrophy is there that is the simplest criteria for uh, assessing there are many criteria but i mean as the the, the current clinical practice it doesn't carry much significance so you need not spend much time on assessing the hypertrophy but what is more important is the ischemia so we all know that actually i mean the the even now the acute coronary syndrome the center of diagnosis is nothing it's not angiogram it's not the biomarker it is the ecg if the ecg is showing std changes you have to admit the patient you have to start treating the patient because we all know that the biomarker the troponin will turn positive after 4 hours only and uh, even uh, the angiogram may not not necessarily always be an objective angiogram but the patient can have recanalization the ecg is showing a dynamic std changes you have to start treatment treat the patient at that point so this is very important so the std changes in the uh, ischemia is we know that whenever there is an elevation it's an acute infarction and whenever there is an ischemia it's a non transmural uh, or it's not the complete occlusion of the artery and there is usually depression in the st segment so and sometimes you can have only t wave changes and uh, there can be q wave changes also we'll come to that so will the most important thing is actually you learn by practice so especially regarding the acute coronary syndrome diagnosis you need to have a good amount of exposure and practice actually because many of times actually the ecgs which you felt like uh, okay there were uh, significant ecg changes you take it to the cardiologist then they say i mean it's not uh, significant and some other times you fairly uh, neglected it as a normal ecg so very uh, there will be subtle changes which the cardiologist has picked up and asked the patient ask the ask you to admit the patient and it turns out to be an acs so this all often bewilders i um, mean your um, curiosity what exactly is uh, the, the the crux of ecg diagnosis so i mean it's uh, it's a very simple it comes by practice it comes by practice and it, even looking at the ecg in one glance we can say sir say whether the patient is suffering from a non cardiac chest pain or a cardiac chest pain all right so this is an ecg very simple ecg you can see that there is st elevation in 2 3 and avf so when we say st elevation it is the j point elevation okay so the j point is nothing but the j points is the point which uh, the where the qrs complex ends and where the st segment or it uh, starts so it is at the end of the s wave okay so or sometimes it at the end of the the down slope of the r wave so you have to uh, remember that this is the end of the qrs complex okay it's not not necessarily every lead has an s wave so it's a end of the qrs complex and that's where the beginning of the r uh, st segment starts so the j point should get elevated whenever there is an st segment for the st elevation uh, to a, to be a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome or uh, myocardial infarction so this is a clearly there is an st j point elevation and it's an inferior wall myocardial infarction the same time you can see that there are st depression in other leads so that is the one avl and you have the st depression in the anterior leads also so that means actually you have the reciprocal we call it the reciprocal changes that is basically the we say it's a reciprocal changes for the 
sake of uh, ecg diagnosis in fact it is the because ecg is nothing but a reflection of the voltages so you have some voltage changes on the other uh, part of the uh, myocardium so that's the reason actually you have ecg changes so uh, it's not necessarily you cannot just uh, discard it as okay this is a just uh, uh, reciprocal changes but it has its own implication i mean when you learn ecg you will learn that it's called yeah, ischemia at a distance so but i mean not going into that actually i mean but this is important uh, this ecg you can see that there is a st depression in 2 3 and avf and v4 to v6 so that means actually we as as i told actually st depression suggests uh, the ischemia it's that means there is no transmural ischemia there is no complete occlusion of the heart uh, the uh, coronary arteries but there is a critical stenosis of the coronary arteries which uh, uh, which creates ischemia okay so this is uh, in the 2 3 avf you can see that the, there is an ischemia in this arteries now we have a couple of ecgs for our practice so we'll just go through the, those ecgs so you can uh, make a diagnosis of the uh, uh, ECG and uh, in the mind and uh, just uh, test your knowledge actually how much you have learned. So this is a normal ECG. I mean the first one was a normal ECG. You can see that as I told uh, it's a P, there is a P wave preceding every QRS complex and the rate is uh, roughly, I mean you can see, you can count the QRS complexes. It's uh, uh, roughly around 5. So the rate is around 60. So uh, it's a sinus rhythm. Now this is a uh, ECG of the first degree heart block. So you can see that the, the same kind of an ECG, but where the PR interval is prolonged. PR interval is more than one large box. So we make a diagnosis of first degree heart block. So this is uh, very important. Uh, as I told actually, you unless you go by this systematic way, we will always miss because even this ECG may look like a normal ECG unless you are carefully looking at the PR interval. So here, I mean, just look at this ECG. You can see that uh, the, as I told, actually, there is no P wave preceding the QRS complex. And uh, you can see that the in the uh, 2, 3 AVF, what we see is there is no R wave. There is a Q wave, uh, rather a Q wave. And there is a ST depression in the 1 and AVL. So there is no P wave. So, but some leads you can see there is a small P wave embedded in the QRS complex. I mean, uh, it's a inverted P wave. I mean, um, I mean you can see uh, when, if you look at carefully on the, the ST segment, uh, there is a uh, inverted P wave. So this is a, a ventricular escape rhythm. Okay. So this is otherwise called an accelerated idioventricular rhythm, uh, AAVR. The accelerate, accelerated idioventricular rhythm, the rate is between uh, 40 to 110 beats per minute. It's just like a, a, a sinus nodal rhythm, but it's not a sinus nodal by rate wise, but it's not a sinus nodal rhythm because there is no P wave preceding the QRS complex. And there is, the QRS is widened. So it should be from the ventricle. So we call it accelerated idioventricular rhythm. It's a, the clinical implication is it's usually a sign of reperfusion in an acute myocardial infarction. So reperfusion happens by uh, by the uh, by thrombolysis or by PCI uh, primary angioplasty. Once the artery, the the, uh, the infected artery, the block is removed, the it's recanalized. You can get this kind of a fast rhythm. So you should not uh, confuse it with the uh, ventricular tachycardia and you should not shock the patient, but rather it's a harmless and it's a, a good rhythm. It shows there is a reperfusion in the uh, infarcted area. So this is accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Now this is another ECG. You can see this ECG, uh, the rate is much low and there is no P wave preceding the QRS complex but the rate is very regular. So that means actually whenever you have a re regular rate, it should be from, there are three uh, pacemakers in the heart. One is the sinus node, then you have the AV node, then you have the bundle of his and the ventricle. So you can have the rhythm from either one of it when you have a regular rhythm. When the rhythm is irregular, 
it may be from the atria or the ventricle okay so the when the, the rhythm is regular it may be from the so the sinus nodal rate is 60 to 100 the av nodal rate is 40 to 60 and the bundle of his uh, and the 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 bundle uh, branch rhythm is around uh, less than 40 so you can see that this rhythm is again a narrow complex rhythm so it should be from the av node it should be from the av node it's a nodal rhythm or otherwise called the junctional rhythm so junction and node is the same actually so you can see that um, there is no p wave so the rate is around uh, 40 to 60 it's a junctional rhythm now this is an ecg uh, which we commonly uh, see and uh, this is a hyperkalemia ecg you can see that you can look at the t wave this is the tall tender t wave of hyperkalemia so this is a very peculiar and a very unique t wave you have a very small base that is it's not a wide t wave it's a small base tall sharp t wave with the almost symmetrical uh, ascending and descending limbs so this is very characteristic of hyperkalemia usually the potassium should go above 6.5 to get an ecg like this and uh, you can see that uh, the p wave is very diminished and sometimes you can get st elevation as well and uh, if it goes above this level you can get the q uh, uh, i mean if it goes below above 7.5 the qr starts widening then finally you have the sine wave rhythm the qr is also widens and the t wave also widens and it becomes like an an uh, i mean a horizontal less that's what we call the sine wave so uh, that is the advanced hyperkalemia and uh, i mean the we may lose the patient if uh, they reach us to that stage so this is very important to diagnose at this stage because uh, especially in patients with the chronic kidney disease and patients who are taking uh, the uh, the spironolactone or the uh, acar uh, uh, bs or uh, the potassium chloride itself uh, so we should always uh, look at the signs of hyperkalemia and uh, ask for a serum potassium immediately this is a very interesting ecg and you should always this ecg is a very peculiar and unique ecg you can see that this kind of a biphasic p wave uh, t wave in lead 2 3 it's called wellensign uh, it's the uh, the doctor the physician who observed and diagnosed it and it correlates with a proximal lad tight stenosis and if you are if anyone of you is working in the uh, cardiology department and has an exposure to the cath lab you can always uh, see that this is a very very uh, sign with a high specificity if you see a patient like this actually biphasic t wave and who had a history of just discomfort in the past preceding days it simply means there is a non occlusive tight lesion in the proximal led which any time can go into a occlusion and a large anterior mite so we should always catch this patient at the earliest and do the uh, angiogram and the revascularization at the earliest. So this is uh, what we call the biphasic T wave in the uh, in the precordial leads, especially V2, V3, and V4, and it's a sign of proximal LAD lesion. Now Brugada syndrome, of course, I mean most of you must have heard of Brugada syndrome. The Brugada uh, is uh, again the physician; they are still alive. The Joseph Brugada and the Raman Brugada both are there in uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, they have identified this syndrome this is seen in young pay people and uh, uh, they present with syncope and some of them I mean the first presentation itself may be a sudden cardiac death so what you get is kind of an incomplete right bundle branch block and this kind of a peculiar ECG where V1 and V2 you will have kind of a it's called a camel's hump just like a camel's hump you will have a peculiar kind of an st elevation uh, it's v1 and v2 and uh, uh, you can see this kind of an ecg uh, this is very peculiar for brugada syndrome and not every person who has this kind of an ecg will have brugada syndrome rather a, this ecg plus history of uh, frequent syncope that carries the diagnosis so the, the otherwise the pattern we simply call brugada pattern brugada pattern so you should have an incomplete rbbv plus uh, this kind of a peculiar uh, st elevation in the v1 to v3 so this is the uh, pattern of the brugada syndrome 